The best health care is there in ways big and small. There when we most and least expect it. We may not see it, but we feel it. It lets us know we're not in this alone. Everyone deserves a health care partner who never quits. One who's there for what matters. United Healthcare. There for what matters. Want your boss to put some real action behind the rhetoric when they talk about making your workplace more inclusive? Find out how to hold their feet to the fire and demand diversity on the Diversity Dude podcast. Hello there, and welcome back to the Diversity Dude podcast. I'm your host, Lambert Fisher, marriage and family therapist, award-winning author, and national speaker on the topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. And for those of you who are interested in even more positive and encouraging tips and strategies beyond what I share in podcasts like this, then feel free to check out my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, nationally recognized for the unique way in which it addresses the often difficult topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. Designed for more than just therapists, if you are a helping professional in any way, Diversity in clinical practice can help you meet the greatest variety of cultural needs possible for those whom you serve. And it's available in paper and audiobook versions for your convenience. And whether it be through my one-on-one relationship building efforts as a therapist or my informing and empowering efforts as an author or speaker, know that my personal mission is to do my part to improve the world one strengthened relationship at a time. So today I want to share with you a few encouraging words about the dilemma of colorblindness. So if you haven't heard it already, writer Coleman Hughes delivered a TED Talk during which he addressed the often debated topic of colorblindness as the concept that we should look beyond race when thinking about equity. And he proposed that replacing race-based policies with class-based policies may be a better way to reduce inequality and ease racial tensions more so than race-conscious policies. For added context, this topic was so hotly debated that leadership at the world-renowned and respected TED conference reportedly considered not post not posting the live conference talk on their website or YouTube following the backlash they received from those who considered Coleman's talk and thus his proposal to be offensive and contributing to continued harmful practices of injustice. Thankfully, they stayed consistent with their mission to spark global conversations on a variety of topics, and Ted did post the talk, and we now get the pleasure of contributing to what is, in fact, the global conversation. Now, staying consistent with my Diversity 2 podcast trend, I want to attempt, I don't want to attempt to solve the debate once and for all, as there are too many factors to, con- to consider and implications that reach far and wide. However, Acknowledging that these debates are not just intellectual or academic exercises, but real life conversations that happen in homes and businesses everywhere, which unfortunately have the potential to negatively impact healthy personal and professional relationships. I want to share a few encouraging considerations to help contribute to healthy discussions and ultimately effective decisions in the near and distant future. Consideration number one is this. Very often, the colorblindness debate is about two different things. The colorblindness term is one that means different things to different people. As a result, many debates on the topic are doomed to be unsatisfactory and incomplete because it's virtually impossible to agree on a solution when we aren't agreeing on the problem. Let me make it even more clear. When some people say, I'm colorblind, what they mean is, when I look at you, I don't see color. I see a person who consists of multiple contributing factors. Some you were born into and others reflect chosen and pursued aspects of your identity. And race or ethnicity is just one of the many things that contribute to who you are. You get to decide how much or or how little race and ethnicity matters in relation to who you are and who you want others to see that you are. I choose not to limit your identity and significance in my life or in many ways access to opportunities to live your best life to the color of your skin. Now, to this, I say, thank you. I very much appreciate the respect that you're showing me, and I'd be happy to show you who I am and learn about who you are in return. However, when others use the same colorblind term, what they mean is something different, as if to say, when I look at you, I don't see color. The color of your skin is just biology and doesn't matter at all. Based on our interactions and access to opportunities for living our best life on the color of our skin is ludicrous. So let's delete this irrelevant skin color factor from our conversations and especially our policies and focus on other factors which have more relevance and reflect what is fair and equitable and contribute to the well-being of everyone. 
And to this, I say, I see your point. While our cultural identity can have varying degrees of significance for all of us, culture is based on many things. Skin color shouldn't be the only factor determining our daily interactions and policy decisions, especially when doing so limits access to reasonable opportunities for those in need. However, here's where it gets interesting. First, let me highlight the first consideration, that these two perspectives both use the same colorblind term, but they're referring to two related but different perspectives. One acknowledges color as one of many aspects of a person that may be relevant, while the other has the tendency, whether intended or not, to convey that color has no relevance at all. Which brings me to the second consideration, which is that colorblindness often makes people feel like their cultural identities or experiences are being deleted or ignored. Efforts to oppose colorblind policies in favor of color conscious policies often do so out of a legitimate fear that colorblind efforts will make people blind to the cultural identities and experiences that are correlated with their skin color. Beyond the commonly assumed victim mentality that assumes that people focus on skin color to preserve their right to claim that they're powerless to improve their lives, many people consider their shared experiences, both good and bad, that were impacted by skin color associations or commonalities to be a significant contributive factor to the resilience factors that contribute to who they are. When people who share a common trait feel unfairly treated based on a factor such as skin color, hear someone who does not share that trait convey that they are blind to color. It's as if to convey that they are blind to the oppressive threats that treated them unfairly. And hear this, you can't be a part of the solution to a problem you've chosen not to see. Let me be clear. In this view, the goal is not to assert that color should be the most important factor. Not at all. Rather, is to convey that it has been and is an important factor in the eyes of those who have been treated unfairly because of the people who are treating them that way. In arguing that color isn't seen in our policies, with colorblind policies, unfortunately, doesn't change the behaviors of those who still see color with their eyes and make decisions influenced by those perspectives. A compromise solution between these two seemingly conflicting perspectives brings me to consideration number two. When, while a colorblind future is a reasonable goal, we must acknowledge the reality of a color conscious presence. Looking at both perspectives together and exploring why there are such angry feelings and accusations of offense often coming from multiple sides, I believe there's a compromise. While the beneficial goal is indeed to get to a point in time where race is not the determining factor in relational and policy decision making, instantly eliminating color conscious policies in favor of color blind policies do not automatically change the minds and behaviors of the people who support those policies and who still find a way to enforce those color blind policies in ways that negatively affect some more so than others based on factors such as color. But it thus also eliminates color conscious policies that are helping individuals and families in need. In his controversial TED talk, Coleman offered a dual recommendation of eliminating race based policies and programming, replacing them with color based policies and programming, and then investing financially in communities in need so that support can go to those in need based on financial need and class need rather than skin color distinctions alone. And there is merit to this proposal from a long-term perspective. In consideration, though, of those who would lose out on their present immediate need meeting support in order to create a more balanced, distant future norm, a modified proposal might be to invest in communities in financial need to reduce race-correlated disparities that currently exist. And then, once things are more equitable, changing the policies and programming to be colorblind moving forward because it's no longer correlated with people's struggles and needs, nor their feeling of injustice or oppression or mistreatment. My hope for you is that you will be able to find a way to see both sides of the colorblindness debate, acknowledging the reasonable future goal of a future where there is no significance that is limiting based on one's skin color, investing our money now, time now, and effort into actionable steps to create that future, while also acknowledging the need meeting benefits of color conscious practices today, as well as the negative color conscious injustices today that need to be addressed. Eliminating cultural color conscious supports doesn't eliminate color conscious oppression. 
However, working to eliminate color conscious oppression can create emotionally and physically safe environments where equity is not only hoped for, but experienced. And thus, elimination of color conscious practices won't be feared because they won't be seen as not any longer needed because of the equitable treatment of all seen everywhere. Unfortunately, that day is not today, and our actions must reflect such. But I hope that I can see it in my lifetime. And I hope that this podcast message, as many others that you will have after as a result, can help you plant seeds that can help it become a reality in due time. And with that, I'll say thanks again for listening in to the Diversity Do podcast. If you have any pressing diversity related questions that you'd like me to address on an upcoming podcast, or if your organization is in need of a shame free or empowering guest speaker or training on this often sensitive topic, then feel free to reach out to me directly at www.diversitymadesimple.com. And if you know of anyone else who can benefit from a positive and encouraging perspective on this often difficult topic, send them a link to this podcast or share with them my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, available on Amazon.com. And as usual, I look forward to addressing as many topics as possible in future podcasts to help you improve as many relationships as possible at work, at home, and in your community. And as always, remember this, you don't need to know everything about everyone in order to have a positive impact on someone. Thank you all for tuning in and have a great day. Tune in each week and find out how to demand and implement diversity at your job. To hear more, check out previous Diversity Dude shows on ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. Hi, I'm Shaletta Brundage. You know what my family and I are doing for MEA weekend? Child, we are going on vacation. And I mean a real vacation. We will not be crisscrossing the state or the country taking my son Andrew to tour college campuses. We found the right fit for him right here in the Twin Cities. It's Doherty Family College at the University of St. Thomas. This two-year college will put him on a path to his four-year degree. With small class sizes, he'll build personal relationships. And I like the free laptops and books. At Doherty Family College, he even gets free bus fare and free breakfast and lunch. This means he won't have to take on debt to get his education. And just think, my son, a Tommy, and me, a Tommy mommy. So for MEA weekend, save yourself some time and travel. Do what we did. Go to dfc.stthomas.edu and set up your own tour at Doherty Family College. Being a teenager today is a real roller coaster ride. Up. And sometimes down even lower. An organization called Treehouse is giving Minnesota teens the support they need to build resiliency. Treehouse is a faith-based nonprofit that offers teens a safe space to share their troubles and learn healthy coping skills with peers and caring adults. Right now, Treehouse needs more volunteers. Do you have a passion to help teens? And would you like to share your wisdom with a middle or high school student who's feeling hopeless? Then sign up to volunteer with Treehouse groups meeting in Bloomington, Brooklyn Park, Plymouth, Minnetonka and Egan. Adult volunteers are needed as mentors, drivers, support group assistants, program assistants, and to help prepare hot meals. Lift up teens in our community and help them find hope and joy by volunteering with Treehouse. Learn more and sign up at treehousehope.org. Click on the Get Involved tab at the top of the page. That's treehousehope.org. The teens can't wait to meet you. It's not just another day in your life. Things are changing for the better. At Comcast, we see those changes and we're thinking about how we use technology today to live, work, learn, and play. And we're building for the future now, so we're better prepared for the wants and needs of tomorrow. That's why Comcast is rolling out multi-gig internet speeds to more than 50 million homes and businesses before the end of 2025, making our already industry-leading network even faster, smarter, greener, and more reliable. Over the decades, Comcast has been your partner, working hard to serve your community, and will continue to be your partner. We're expanding our gigabits so you can enjoy the tiny bits that matter most. Would someone you love be at high risk if they got COVID-19? 
then be sure to take some steps to keep them safe before you visit. Ask your health care provider if you should wear a mask before spending indoor social time with a loved one who's older, has chronic health conditions, or is immunocompromised. And consider self-testing to detect infection before you visit. Even people who are showing no symptoms can have COVID-19 and can unknowingly pass it to others. Do your part to keep your loved ones safe because for some people, COVID-19 is still a true danger. You know Shaletta makes you laugh. But did you know Shaletta Brundage can also make you think and boost your business? Media personality, activist, and comedian Shaletta Brundage founded Shaletta Makes Me Laugh to celebrate and share the best of black culture. It's a podcasting platform. You can download 10 weekly podcasts hosted by African-American subject experts at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com is also a production house creating broadcast quality commercial content. And Shaletta and her team of storytellers create powerful promotional campaigns to get businesses the brand awareness they're looking for. Some of Minnesota's top businesses trust Shaletta, and you can too. Get out the word about your events and products and get in front of communities of color with ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. She's got the power to help your business.